Thank you. Thank you, the organizers, for inviting me to give this uh, talk. Uh, my plan is to talk about, um, actually combine a little bit the, the data, the progress in the data and the theory, and on, the, on the theory side, in large-scale structure of the universe. So I'll be talking, uh, I'll start uh, actually with some data, then I'll switch on to theory. I'll talk, tell you a little bit about how the theoretical uh, progress is being made, you know, what are the challenges and stuff like that, and I'll tell you about the data, data again and what the future challenges are both on the theory side and on the data side. All right, so uh, first of all, let me start with uh, the, the part which is very easy, where uh, the theory is under um, good control, which is this homogeneous universe. You know, on very large scales, we can think of universe as being homogeneous, and we can do things like redshift distance relation. Uh, this is what Hubble published uh, you know, a long, long time ago, and nowadays we have come a long way from that. This is a, a redshift distance relation where we measure the distance using the supernovae, which were thought to be standard candles, and we do the redshift, and so we get uh, Di diagrams like that, and of course, as you probably all know, based on this kind of measurements, uh, dark energy has been discovered, and the Nobel Prize has been given for that. So uh, there's another way to do this diagram, which is uh, not using supernovae, but using baryonic acoustic oscillations, and I'll talk about that in a second. But um, let me first, you know, go, where do we go beyond the homogeneous universe? We first start to do linear perturbation theory. Uh, linear perturbation theory um, for dark matter, for cold dark matter, for example, is very simple. Uh, you write down the action, you write down the equations of motion, just usually Newton's uh, law uh, equations on small scales, and then on large scales they have to be supplemented with some GR effects. Uh, we take moments, uh, we, we write down basically phase space distribution, we take moments, uh, and this leads to the usual um, uh, Vlaso equation, that then if one takes the moments of that, one gets the usual continuity equation, we're rating velocity and density, for example, then Euler equation, which is essentially just Newton's law, and so on. And of course, this has to be supplemented by the Poisson's equation. So this, again, this is a, the Newtonian description. Then if you want to do the GR description, then we have to add some more terms here. So, uh, and then what do we do? Uh, we linearize these equations. Uh, you know, there, there are second order uh, terms uh, here and here. And so we linearize them, and we get the usual linear equations, which then lead to the standard growth of perturbations in an expanding universe. It turns out the growth of perturbations is uh, given by this linear growth solution, which is essentially a power law, more or less, uh, in terms of the expansion rate of the universe. And so, you know, for einstein sitter universe, it's particularly simple. It grows like this. And at late times, the, when dark energy dominates, then it falls below this rate. It, it grows less rapidly. In fact, it stops growing. So that's the linear theory. Uh, on large scales, on scales com uh, comparable to the Hubble uh, scale, we have to supplement this with the GR. Uh, and then for uh, other components, not cold dark matter, but flu for other fluids, for example, baryons is another fluid, we have to supplement this equation also by the scattering term between photons and baryons. Uh, and then for photons and trinos, it turns out uh, fluid equation, uh, fluid description is not good enough, we have to do the Boltzmann. Uh, description, again, you know, taking this phase space distribution but taking uh, more moments. Uh, in fact, it turns out to be an infinite hierarchy in that case. Um, we supplement this with Einstein's equations, which are just uh, basically, basically Poisson's equation, but uh, applied to large scales as well. Plug into the Boltzmann codes, and the results are the well-known CMB and isotropies uh, on linear scales, which have been proven really successful. So that's a success story of a large scale structure and uh, cosmology. Um, and uh, one example is these baryonic acoustic oscillations. There was a movie, but I transferred this now, so I'm not going to show you the movie here. But basically, the idea is that photons and baryons are tightly coupled. They uh, propagate um, um, waves out of initial overdensity, and these waves stall when recombination happens. That's typically at a, roughly at a distance of 150 megaparsecs. And that's a typical scale that we can measure in the data. In the CMB has been measured. You have probably seen those CMB, CMB uh, power spectra. Um, but it turns out you can measure it also in galaxy clustering. Uh, it turns out this is a standard ruler. This baryonic acoustic oscillation scale is a standard ruler because we have measured its physical scale using uh, CMB. And then we can determine this standard ruler. We can measure it up in the sky in the, in the galaxy distribution both in the transverse direction, we can measure it, where we, it's essentially telling us the angular diameter distance to the, to the galaxies, and in the radial direction, where we measure the redshifts, and that's essentially telling us the Hubble parameter, if we know the redshifts. All right, so we can essentially measure two numbers out of this as a function of redshift, 
as a function of redshift of the galaxies. So um, this has been really successful in recent years, especially uh, due to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, where, which measures galaxies both at low redshift. This would be uh, redshift less than one, in fact, more, more like less than 0.7 redshift. These are so-called luminous red galaxies um, that have been used for this purpose. But there also, there's also a lot of uh, quasars uh, with their own spectra, where we measure the so-called Lyme alpha forest. And we can also measure the same information out of this. So uh, this um, BOSS survey is on 10,000 square degrees, 1.5 million re galaxy redshifts, about 150,000 uh, quasar redshifts. And the results are, are shown here, for example, for this bar baryonic acoustic oscillation. I'm showing this correlation function, for example. You see a bump here, roughly at uh, 180 inverse megaparsecs. In the power spectrum, it comes out even, even more nicely once you've filtered out the, the, the broadband power, and it should, looks like this. Really nice oscillations. Now, if you just look at the distribution of galaxies in the sky, you wouldn't really see anything, right? You don't really see a circle uh, by your eyes here, but when you do the correlation function or power spectrum, then this comes out very nicely. So uh, you can also do this with this Lyman Alpha uh, Forest Survey using these qu 150,000 quasars, and there's a bump there as well. All right. In fact, there's a bump there both in the older correlation of Lyman Alpha Forest and also in the cross correlation between Lyman Alpha Forest and quasars. Uh, there's a you know a hint of a bump, but actually, nevertheless, this this actually turns out to be to have quite a lot of information. So I can now do the di uh, the Hubble diagram, the one I've shown you before for the redshift distance relation. For supernovae, I can also do this for these baryonic acoustic oscillations. Uh, and here is shown, you know, there are several different distances that, that one can define, as I mentioned before, right? One is in the Hubble direction, in the real direction, one is in the transit direction, and one is the kind of averaged. Um, and this is, you know, a nice scaling that, and these are the theoretical lines for Lambda CDM model. You can see the, the data are fit pretty well with Lambda CDM, except for maybe some discrepancies at high redshift, which we still need to understand better, but they are only to sigma level. You'll notice that we can actually do this all the way down to low redshifts, and that, uh, in fact, there's something which has uh, recently emerged as the best way of measuring Hubble constant, which is we can combine these supernovae with these uh, baryonic acoustic oscillations to a so-called inverse distance ladder. Uh, we can measure basically the same, um, we, can, we can calibrate the supernovae. Supernovae, what are supernovae? They are standard candles, we think, but we don't know their intrinsic uh, absolute luminosity. So we cannot determine the Hubble constant from the supernovae. We just know that they're standard candles, but we don't know how bright they are, really, intrinsically. But we can actually calibrate the, the brightness of supernovae using the baryonic acoustic oscillations if we do this at the same redshift. For example, we can do this at redshift 0.55 using this BOSS survey. These are the supernovae. The, the black points are supernovae. The blue point is the BAO. Uh, the two have to be calibrated, um, have to give the same information because they're measuring the same number as redshift 0.55. And then we can use supernovae to extrapolate this down to redshift 0. In this way, we actually get a Hubble constant, essentially free of any, any uh, assumptions. And the number that comes out to is about 67 plus or minus 1. Uh, this is, I think, very important because this, uh, the, the value of the Hubble parameter has been all over the place for, for decades, basically ever since the Hubble. Hubble has measured a number which was 500, then it was slowly coming down. There, was, there were long debates for many decades between people favoring 50 and people favoring 100. And now we think we know it to about a percent and a half or so. OK, so um, this is how much we can get um, from linear theory, just from so-called um, uh, semi uh, um, from the classical tests of cosmology. So linear theory, we think uh, this is a power spectrum of the density perturbations. Uh, we think linear theory uh, works on very large scales, k less than 0.1 or so. k is the wave vector. Uh, you know, 1 over k is lambda, it's, you know, 10 megaparsecs, so on scales larger than 10 megaparsecs, we think linear theory works well. And then on small scales, we think it's very nonlinear, and we have to, to go beyond linear theory. So um, how far can we go, and how, uh, what can we do uh, to go beyond linear theory? That's, so let me now move on to beyond linear theory. Um, so what do we do? We, uh, we have perturbation theory. And uh, there are actually several versions of perturbation theory. Let me, let me first describe the standard perturbation theory because it's simpler to understand. You know, I've shown you already before that there are two terms that are nonlinear, but they're nonlinear in quadratic way, delta times v. Uh, that's in the continuity equation. And then this is v grad v um, in the Euler's equation. 
we can basically, since these are, these are just quadratic terms, we can write them down in terms of the couplings of the second order fields, all right, and we can basically collect all the linear terms uh, on the left-hand side, all the nonlinear terms on the right-hand side, but they are just quadratic, and we can therefore just uh, write down a hierarchy and answers like this, um, and solve for this for these ansatz using, and we find the so-called kernels, recursive kernels, which solve for this for this equation. Okay, so if we want to comp compare the, the power spectrum, we have to do perturbation theory, uh, and it has to be a, a loop uh, diagrams that one has to solve. You know, so there's a two-two loop diagram and one-three loop diagram. So third order cross correlated with the first order, and the second order other correlated with itself. And basically, you can go through the algebra, you get the, the expressions that solve for this. And you can go to higher loops as well. Okay, so in principle, this all looks very simple, uh, but it's not. Um, and um, so how well does it work? Um, here is the prediction from the simulations. This is all for uh, uh, dark matter. This is a linear theory. These are simulations, the blue points, and the green line is this prediction from the one loop uh, uh, standard perturbation theory. And you can see standard perturbation theory does do something right here initially, around K of 0.1, but then it quickly overshoots the, the, the simulations. All right, the, uh, it's, it's easy to understand why this is so. Uh, it turns out these are loop integrals. These loop integrals extend all the way to high uh, momenta, to high uh, Q. And because of that, you know, you go into a regime where perturbation theory is not supposed to work because density perturbation is larger than one. And because of that, uh, you, not, uh, you should not trust the results in this high Q. So that's one reason, but there are actually, uh, there's an even more important reason, which is that perturbation theory in general should not work. Okay, I'll get to that in a second. Um, you can also see, for example, that standard, uh, standard perturbation theory should fail for certain power law uh, universes where the integrals just diverge, right? and whereas the real result, of course, doesn't diverge. Okay, so um, before I go to explaining um, what is missing in perturbation theory, let me tell you another way to do perturbation theory, which is using so-called Lagrangian perturbation theory. In this case, uh, what we think about is in, not in terms of these fluid descriptions like density and velocity, but we think in terms of just uh, particle displacement. So we write the particle position um, as the initial position plus the displacement. Okay? And then we can get the density perturbation by just mapping from the initial density, which is homogeneous, to the final density. Right? So we get this kind of uh, Jacobian. Uh, which, for example, you know, if you write, if you know what psi is, you can you can do this gradient uh, here, and you can write this kind of solution, which is called the so-called Zeldovich approximation. Um, you can, inter it turns out, that you can write uh, perturbation theory this way uh, in this formalism as well. You can you get an equation which is an equation for the displacement field rather than for, for the density. It's a single equation, but of course, the displacement field is a vector, uh, and the equation looks like this. You can again plug in perturbative of uh, ansatz and get a hierarchy of solutions of which the first one is just a so-called Zeldovich approximation, uh, so-called, essentially it's like linear theory, except it goes beyond linear in the sense that you can, you know, you can get very high densities and you can even get caustics and so on in this case. Uh, this is, this is so-called 2LPT solution and so on and so forth. Okay, so very similar. So how well does this one work? This one has the opposite problem. Um, here again, I'm showing the ratio of the power spectrum to the, to the, to the basically so-called no wiggle linear power spectrum. This is the linear theory, this line here. These are the simulations here. This is this SPT1 loop that I've shown you before. And then these are, these are the various LPT solutions. And these have the problem, the LPT has, the Lagrangian perturbation theory has the problem of not having enough power. So it's the opposite problem of SPT. But on the other hand, a Lagrangian perturbation theory does something, something's right. For example, it gets the baryonic acoustic oscillation very, very well. This linear theory, Okay, SPT doesn't do so well in this, in this regime, uh, but Lagrangian perturbation theory, uh, for example, just a simple Zadovich does really well on explaining the damping of the baryonic acoustic oscillations. Um, okay, so let me move on. So if we look at the pictures of the simulations of LPT, we can understand better why, what's failing in LPT, and what is failing is that LPT, Lagrangian perturbation theory, does, doesn't, doesn't condense particles into dark matter halos. This is the true simulation, which you can see all these dark matter particles inside these clumps called halos, whereas um, LPT doesn't do that. Okay, so why doesn't it do that? Um, it doesn't do that because uh, it doesn't stop particles at the shell crossings. Okay, the particles just keep streaming. In the Dovich approximation, that's obvious. You know, it's just particles just, just do this, create a, a caustic, and then just keep moving on. 
In fact, it's a nice way to see this in 1D, uh, which I think is useful. Um, and um, in 1D, what, the reason why it's useful is because in 1D, if you write down the dynamics, you can write down an exact solution in perturbative sense. And, um, and the reason for that is that force is dependent on distance, so you can actually exactly solve. And it turns out this one LPT, Zeldovich, uh, is actually not an approximation, it's an exact solution in perturbative sense. You can also show that SPT, the one that I've shown, that I've said, that I've talked about before, SPT, um, if you resum SPT to infinite order, you will get uh, LPT, one LPT. So in this sense, SPT is inferior to uh, one LPT in one T because um, it is always, uh, you know, only in infinite number of loops you get to uh, uh, LPT in this case in one D. However, neither of these are correct. Uh, and the reason they're not correct is because of the shell crossings. Uh, here I'm showing you, for example, uh, so there's several lines here. There's, for example, second order SPT, which you see it always differs from the, from the full nonlinear, which is blue. But Zeldovich, which is red, you know, initially is perfect against the blue. It's still perfect here. This is a function of time. And then once you have the shell crossings, what happens to the dark matter is that it, stick, it sticks together, it's glued together inside these shell crossings, which we call halos. And whereas the Zeldovich just keeps streaming through and uh, creates an error, which you can see, for example, here. Red is not different from blue. Okay, so um, this shell crossing happens shortly after the, the uh, perturbations go nonlinear. So if you, one way to think about this is that the reach of SPT is roughly where things are nonlinear, so roughly where dense perturbations are for a unity, whereas the reach of PT itself is roughly where things uh, collapse, which, for example, in 3D, we know things collapse at roughly at the density of 1.68 or so. So it's going to be slightly, on slightly smaller scales, but not, not much different. All right, so, so convergence radius is larger for, uh, for the non-perturbative effects, um, but they are still of the same order. Okay, so uh, what about the power spectrum in 1D? Power spectrum in 1D, uh, as shown here, for example, this is now the lowest power spectrum, which I've, sh which I've said is exact at the perturbative level, and this is the black line here, but the true power spectrum from the simulation is this one here, and clearly they differ a lot. Okay, um, and they differ by, so, so whatever the difference is between these two is non-perturbative. It's something beyond perturbation theory. So what can we do in that case? Well, we, obviously we cannot use perturbation theory anymore, and so the best thing we can do, we can just parameterize our ignorance, and we can do this by either adding something to the perturbative perturb solution or taking the ratio, right? So these are, you know, simple ways. So for example, if you take the ratio, we call this ratio the transfer function, and we can expand this transfer function in terms of uh, you know, simple uh, expansions. For example, the, it turns out that because of the mass momentum conservation, the lowest order expansion term has to, be, has to go as k squared, and then there may be other terms. Okay? So this is basically what uh, effective field theory does, uh, more or less. It's basically you can parameterize this and assume that maybe this coefficient is, there's just one coefficient that's k squared, or maybe you add more coefficients. Here, in fact, I'm showing you how well we can do uh, using these ansatz as a function of these coefficients, for example. If you write this transfer function as, as 1 plus ak square, you know, then that gives you 1% accuracy up to k of 0.2, roughly. Then if you go to third order, then it gives you 1% accuracy up to k of 0.5. But again, these are, these are things, where, where do things go nonlinear? They roughly go nonlinear here, and for example, if you do the SPT, look at the XPT expansion, which I told you that adding SPT adds up to Zeldovich, then one loop SPT fails already at k of 0.05. Two loop SPT fails roughly at k of 0.1. This is this one here. And then even five loop SPT doesn't, doesn't do much better. Okay, so the two have similar radius of convergence, but the, this, uh, the failure of PT itself has slightly larger radius convergence. So you can get pretty far by just assuming the first order expansion. All right, so uh, what, what happens, so what, which of these lessons can be ex uh, then expanded to 3D? Um, most of these things are still true in 3D, except that um, it's no longer true that um, LPT is necessarily better than SPT. Um, the reason for that is that uh, in 3D, you get these higher loop terms, both in SPT and LPT, they, they no longer um, have, um, they no longer 
can be shown to be a convergent series in the sense that, for example, in 1D, you can show that at low k, uh, two loop stars at k to the 4 p linear, one loop at k squared, and so on. So there's a convergent series at low k. In 3D, this is no longer the case. And the reason for that is that there are basically additional terms that come in, um, additional displacements, that uh, at for one loop, for example, here I'm showing you just the, the ratio of the predictions of the one loop um, LPT against the tree level LPT relative to the simulations. And as you go to low ratio, then it's, it's getting worse and worse. So the additional contributions that are completely spurious, and they're spurious because um, particles should be glued inside the dark matter halos, and they're not in, this, in these approaches. OK, so, uh, and because of that, the high loop terms can be completely wrong, and it's not even clear that you gain much by adding them. So, uh, so what are the challenges for uh, broadband power then? Uh, well, you know, as I already mentioned, one challenge is, well, how do we know that we need just one parameter? OK, fine, uh, maybe it's good enough. Uh, but there's certainly more parameters that need to be included to, to cancel the, these high loop terms, right? And so it's, you know, it's then, technical challenge, basically how you do this and what, how many parameters you need to introduce and so on and so forth. So I'm not, I won't go into details. Uh, there's also this issue of stochasticity. Basically, you know, the way I defined this uh, was in terms of this transfer function, which in principle should really be cross-correlation between uh, perturbation theory and the full solution divided by the other correlation. Uh, and the difference between the cross-correlation and whatever is left is called stoch stochastic terms, and they, those are also important, and they become of order 1% roughly at k of 0.2. Um, anyway, so there's basically, so let me, let me skip this and let me just show you, for example, uh, one thing you can do is you can try, uh, just look at how far you can do with uh, perturbation theory and then parameterize your ignorance by introducing these sort of so-called EFT parameters. And then you ask, well, how, how large are these EFT parameters and how much are they uh, changing with scale? So we've done this here in this exercise. And uh, for example, this is the Zeldovich um, approximation. Uh, and you can just define, you know, just like in 1D, you can define an EFT parameter uh, relative to Zeldovich. And you, know, you, get a, you get it, but it's changing with scale. Okay, so this is the dash line here. Uh, you can do the same thing for various other perturbation theory approaches. Um, for example, this one is for one loop SPT, which you can see it's roughly constant up to k.1, but then it's changing with scale again. And you can also do this for, for example, two-loop SPT, which, you know, if, if you're optimistic, then you can say it's, up, it's roughly constant here in this range, but then again, it's changing with scale here. So basically, these are the challenges that one needs to address uh, if this is to work. And if you are, insist that this has to be a number, a constant number, then you can see that, you know, it can only go up to k of 0.2 or so, which is also where stochasticity becomes important. However, the, on the more optimistic, um, on the more positive note, this approach certainly helps in terms of uh, explaining the residuals in the baryonic acoustic oscillations. Here I'm showing, for example, the residuals um, for various of these um, models, um, where I'm just asking how well do these models explain the damping of baryonic acoustic oscillations beyond their usual uh, value. And you can see that uh, some of these models do really, really well. In other words, they really explain all of the damping really well. You know, to have to Precision, which is you know a fraction of a percent, so in this sense, it's very good. So how can we do better? How can we go to higher k? So phenomenologically, what we usually do is we introduce a so-called halo model. The, what, what went wrong in perturbation theory? It, perturbation theory was unable to do small-scale halos, shell crossings. All right, and so what we can do is we can just add another component, which are which are the halos, which are basically the places where the shell crossings occurs, and we uh, add their correlations both inside the halos, which we call the so-called one halo term, for example, and you know, we can expand this one halo term in terms of the moments and so on, um, and we get this kind of expansion. And then there's also correlations between the halos, which we can also expand and so on, and we get terms like this. Uh, I won't go into details, but uh, this approach, at least physically, phenomenologically, uh, you know, uh, allows you to go you know, to much smaller scales of course, always at the price of introducing parameters, but that's all we can do, right? Remember, perturbation theory can only get you so far. You'll never be able to do shell crossing with perturbation, with perturbation theory. So we really just want to parameterize our ignorance in the best possible way. Okay, so uh, for example, here I'm showing a total, uh, an example of this. 
where uh, um, the black solid line is a simulation, uh, the blue line is a large power spectrum, and then I'm adding this one halo term here, and I get a total which agrees very well with the total with the with the simulation. And here's another example of this, of, you know, of this kind of modeling with three extra parameters, for example, you know, you can get very very precision up to you know high k, small scales. Okay, so um, but nevertheless, this was just uh, to some extent academic exercise because this was all dark matter, but the data really don't care about that so much because. Uh, in the real world, we observe galaxies. We also observe dark matter, but we usually it's mixed with some other stuff. So let me just tell you quickly about the real world um, in terms of galaxy clustering. We observe these things. We measure, for example, the amplitude of clustering, power spectrum of normal galaxies or of these red galaxies. We go and we see that they are very different. So there's a, you know, for example, there's a power spectrum of normal galaxies, there's a power spectrum of red galaxies there's a factor of four difference here. The reason for that is that there's a biasing in there. Galaxies are not tracing dark matter perfectly. They are tracing the dark matter up to a constant, or maybe it's not even a constant, maybe it's a function of scale. And we call this bias. Okay, so uh, how can we determine this bias? One way to do this is to use redshift space distortions where the velocities that are basically in the radial direction, what we're measuring is not just the position of the galaxy, but also plus velocity. And so we can do this uh, to measure uh, redshift space distortions, as we call them. So the contours of eyes of constant uh, correlation function become squashed like this. And the uh, information of squashing is, is hidden in, in terms of velocity relative to density, which we call the so-called uh, logarithmic growth rate, F. Um, this is another picture of this, where I'm uh, adding also the nonlinear effects. In terms of on small scales, we have virial velocities inside the halos. Which, are, um, which produce this kind of distortions in the real direction. And this is a completely nonlinear effect which we cannot model using perturbation theory. So then what do we do? Well, we try again. We try to combine the perturbation theory on large scales using some kind of this effective description on small scales. Here's the data where we see on large scales, the data look really good compared to these simple analytic models on large scales. But then on small scales, we start seeing these so-called fingers of God here. Okay, if you take this and take the power spectrum, you get this kind of measurements. I don't have time to go into this. But basically, can we model the quasi-linear regime and extract more information? The answer is yes, but at the, at the price of adding more parameters. Uh, and basically, these parameters, again, that they are kind of HILO model based, and they are uh, trying to encompass all the ignorance and all the small scale phases that we have no hope of getting out of perturbation theory. Uh, here is an example. Basically, we have tried this uh, using modeling the power spectrum in simulations. Uh, the, here's the power spectrum function of angle um, along the line of sight, and the, the message of this picture is twofold. First of all, linear theory would predict these lines to be flat. You see, they're never flat. In other words, nonlinear effects are extremely important to modeling redshift space distortions at all scales, pretty much. And um, so, it's really, really important to include nonlinear effects. Uh, on the other hand, these models, you know, the solid lines through the through the simulations. You know, do a pretty good job. The residuals are 4 to 1% up to K of 0.4. And so there's hope that you know, using this nonlinear modeling, one can do a lot better. Um, OK, so I was going to mention also uh, weak lensing, but I think you heard about this um, uh, in, from previous talks. And um, especially Joe Dunkley probably has shown you this uh, state of the art in the weak lensing of Cosmic Accurate Background. So let me skip this. Uh, let me just mention one more thing, which is on small scales, in weak lensing also, you know, we don't measure just dark matter power spectrum in weak lensing. There are baryons that are affecting things inside the halos. And again, we want to basically immunize ourselves against that. We want to have a good description of how we get rid of those effects and still extract information. We can do this exactly the same way as we have done in all these uh, other cases. For example, a halo model. In a halo model picture, we can say, well, the, the mass hasn't changed inside the halo, but it has been maybe redistributed because you, we have AGN feedback effects changing the mass distributions and so on, but not changing the mass. So this is a good way to, to describe this. And even though the effects are large, uh, if you know how to describe them and you know how to marginalize over them, then you don't lose much information. So this is one message that's coming out of these things, that even though the effects appear large, they're not actually all that bad in the end because we know how to marginalize over them. OK, finally, uh, just one uh, application of all this machinery is neutrino mass. Why, do, why are we doing this large-scale structure? We want to measure a lot of things, neutrino mass and so on. Uh, neutrino mass, what, what happens if you have, neutrinos have mass, they suppress 
the structure on small scales relative to large scales. And this is something we can measure if we compare the large scale structure observations like this to the CMB. Um, you can see that the suppression depends on the, on the amount of mass. So the more mass neutrinos have, the more the, the small scale structure is suppressed. And if we therefore observe galaxy clustering or weak lensing, we can extract neutrino mass. The current state of the art of this is shown here. This is, these are the large scale structure constraints, and these are the CMB constraints from Planck, and they kind of combine here. This is now in omega matter and sigma 8 plane, which maybe you don't care about, but if you look at, for example, constraints on neutrino mass, then you're getting this kind of posteriors. This depends actually somewhat on this so-called optical depth uh, that is a complication in the case of CMB. Uh, so let's choose a value that has been recently advocated by Planck, and then we get you know, the sum of neutrino masses is peaks at roughly 0.14 with roughly two sigma away from zero. So we're starting to see some evidence of non-zero neutrino mass, but we certainly are nowhere near to distinguishing between uh, normal hierarchy and inverted hierarchy of neutrinos. Okay, uh, another thing, this is my last slide um, before, uh, well, next to the last slide. Um, and I just want to, I mean, probably you've heard this before from uh, Joe Dunkley, but I just want to, you know, leave you how impressive the recent combination of large scale structure and, and Planck has been. Uh, if you take curvature, curvature is an important parameter, okay? The, you know, string theorists, for example, tell you that this is the most important parameter to go and measure. Um, and uh, if you go and measure just from the CMB, you get an error which is of order a percent or so. By the time, then you add lensing, the error drops down by a factor of three, and this is lensing of CMB, so this is still just Planck data. And uh, if you add also then the BAO, really just BOSS data, for, then it, it, it drops down by another factor of four, so that o overall adding basically lensing and BAO to Planck reduces the error on curvature by a factor of 12. This all happened basically in, you know, within the last you know, few months, right? this improvement by factor 12. So it doesn't very often happen that you, you know, get a new experiment, in, at least in cosmology, where things improve by a factor of 10 or more, and yet the value is still consistent with zero. So no open universe um, and no confirmation of um, or this confirmation of uh, landscape yet. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, we can do a lot better in the future. Uh, there's going to be a lot, a lot of surveys in this future, uh, both spectroscopic uh, surveys uh, called DES, EPFS, and imaging surveys, DES, you know, a lot of names. The plan here is to measure hundreds of millions of galaxies on the imaging side and tens of millions of galaxies on the spectroscopic side and just get more and more information. There's also a lot of improvement on CMB and there are also new techniques. All right, and so let me uh, just show you one more slide which is how well we may be able to do in the future with these surveys. For example, we can do, look for the running of the spectral index uh, and try maybe to probe inflation using uh, the running of the spectral index. And we can probably hope to do a lot better on the promoted energosanity, which I have not talked about a lot. But future surveys uh, of large structure can do really, really well on the promoted energosanity, maybe getting errors below 1 or maybe even below uh, 0.2 or so. And with this kind of things, we can probe uh, inflation really, really well with the future uh, surveys. OK, this is actually just a proposal of so-called SphereX. Uh, it's not approved yet, um, but it's really exciting if one can uh, realize this. Okay, so let me uh, leave the summary here and stop. Okay, thank you very much. So we have time for maybe one or two questions. Thank you very much. My question related to the uh, stochastic term that you told us in the EFT theory. What do you mean about the stochastic term? Yes. Um, so let me answer this in the, in the language I, I was using here, okay, and probably other people uh, working on EFT maybe have a different definition. But in the language I was using here is that you can, for example, use your perturbation theory, like 1 LPT, 2 LPT, and then you can cross-correlate that with the dark matter, um, and you get something. You can then pull all the information that comes from the cross correlation, and there's still something left, all right, to the total power spectrum. And we call that something left, uh, we call that toxicity. 
the reason why we separate this is because we expect that at least at low k, that this correlated part uh, goes as, for example, p linear times k square, whereas this uncorrelated part, this stochastic part, goes initially as k to the four due to the mass momentum conservation, and then you know does something else at higher k. But they have very different uh, functional forms. One scales with p linear, the other one doesn't. Okay. Um, one more quick question. Urgent questions? No? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again.